What I tried to do uh, with this book, with Origins, was look at all the different ways that features of our planet, that the world that we live on, have had a huge influence, a defining role in the playing out of human history. So everything from plate tectonics and continental drift to the churning of the atmosphere high above our heads to where different natural resources or metals could be found. And what I want to do for you this afternoon is pick out just three examples from Origins, the stories that I found to be the most mind-blowing and fascinating when I was researching and writing this book. And so we'll start with Mesopotamia. We'll start with the origins of civilization itself. Mesopotamia was the cradle of civilization, where some of the first cities on planet Earth appeared. And Mesopotamia is located in this part of the world, on the Arabian Peninsula. And actually, the tectonic environment of the Arabian Peninsula is very interesting. It's kind of quirky. And so what we're seeing on this map in the orange lines are the tectonic boundaries. These are the cracks in the fractured eggshell of the crust of planet Earth. Those are the edges between the different plates. And what you can see at the bottom there is this characteristic Y-shaped pattern of cracks running down uh, the Red Sea and also through the Gulf of Aden, and then a long crack running a long way south, which is the Great East African Rift Valley, which is where we evolved as a species. And when that system of cracks opened up, it effectively tore off a chunk of the top corner of the continent of Africa to create the Arabian Peninsula. And then as the Red Sea continued to widen and grow, as there is a growing sea with plate tectonics, this huge lump of crust, this Arabian Peninsula, swung outwards like a barn door caught in the wind and slammed up into the underside of Eurasia. And when continents slam into each other, you drive up huge chains of mountain ranges. And the mountain range that was driven up by that collision of the Arabian Peninsula was the Zagros Mountains. Now, the other important fact that's going on here is that when you have huge mountain ranges, great big thick lumps of rock sat on the crust of our planet. It's very, very heavy. It sits heavy. It sags down into the skin of the, of the earth. And so what you very, very often find running alongside a chain of mountains, running along the feet of those mountains, are very flat, low-lying regions called foreland basins, which you can see in shades of green here in this topographic map, in this terrain map. And that foreland basin is what we call Mesopotamia. It's very smooth, it's very flat, it runs downhill from the mountains to north, down into the Persian Gulf, and so two rivers started flowing down through this region, the Tigris and Euphrates. The Mesopotamian region means the land between the two rivers. And so this part of the planet is just naturally absurdly easy to grow lots of food very productively with simple, early, primitive agriculture. You've got the reliability of water from those rivers. It's very flat, so it makes irrigation very easy. And the soil that's been deposited in that whole basin is effectively alluvial silt, river mud that's been dumped out of the rivers when it eroded from the very young mountains towards the north. It's exceedingly fertile and nutritious for growing food in. This region of the planet, because of plate tectonics, is just naturally set up for making agriculture very easy, for growing lots of food, for feeding a growing population of humans who then started settling down into cities. So in Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers became the land of the first cities on the earth, places like Ur and Uruk, and then later Babylon. And so civilization began in the tectonic setting in Mesopotamia. And on the other side of the planet, at the same time, around 3000 BC, under identical tectonic settings, the Indus River Valley civilization was emerging in the Foreland Basin, running alongside the toes of the towering mountain range of the Himalayas. Some of the earliest civilizations on our planet arose in an environment that made agriculture very easy because of a fundamental planetary feature, because of that plate tectonic effect and the mountain chains. 
Now, civilization began in Mesopotamia, but it spread, and it spread to places including the Mediterranean, which you're probably very familiar with in terms of the history of the world. And I'm sure you can think of plenty of different societies and cultures and civilizations that have flourished around this great inland sea, from the Minoans, the Phoenicians, the Etruscans, the Mycenaeans, to the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans. But when you think about it, the vast majority of all of these Mediterranean cultures, Mediterranean civilizations, were all clustered on one half of that sea. They're all on the northern boundary of the Mediterranean and not the southern boundary. And this is a very small inland sea. You can sail easily from one side to the other in a matter of days, uh, often without having to even lose sight of land. It's very easy to sail across. And yet for thousands of years, from the very beginnings of the Bronze Age, there was this huge disparity in human activity between a vibrant northern coastline of the Med and a very quiet, boring, in terms of human cities and civilizations along the southern margin. And to understand why that might be, why there's been this huge disparity in human activity around the Mediterranean, we have to understand where the Med came from in the first place. And it turns out that the Mediterranean Sea today is no more than a mere puddle left behind from what was once a vast, giant ocean, an ocean the size of the Atlantic in its heyday. So if you wind back the time of our planet's history, looking up in the top right there to about 240 million years ago, about a quarter of a billion years ago, with this constant scudding of the continents around the face of the Earth with continental drift, the land masses had all congregated and smashed together to build this single giant supercontinent called Pangaea, the all land. And held within the cup of that C-shaped supercontinent was the ocean called the Tethys. Now, now, no sooner had this, this giant supercontinent formed, but it began to tear and rip itself apart again, forming the continents that we're familiar with in the global map and the map of the world today. So Africa split from North and then South America. India ripped off from that and started heading north again. And Africa also started heading north back into the underside of Eurasia. And in that process of continental, continental drift, this entire ocean of Tethys was swallowed up and destroyed. It was subducted into the deep interior of our planet. And that feature has been important for thousands of years of human history. Because it is Africa riding north into the underside of Eurasia and Europe here. It's crumpled up this huge linked chain of mountain ranges, as we saw earlier with Mesopotamia which means that the northern margin of the Mediterranean, when the sea levels rose again after the last Great Ice Age, is full of lots of inlets and coves and bays and thousands of archipelagos of little islands and natural harbors. The northern half of the Mediterranean is ideally set up for seafaring cultures, for trading, for exploring, for communicating and exchanging with each other. Whereas because it is Africa, that is being subducted into the depths of the earth and destroyed, its coastline along, that along, along the Mediterranean is very smooth and flat and boring in comparison. There are effectively no natural harbors across thousands of miles of coastline of North Africa, so it's been unaccommodating to civilizations. For thousands of years, we had this disparity in human activity driven ultimately by the stage that was created by plate tectonics millions of years ago in our Earth's past. So this shifting of the surface of the planet beneath our feet over millions of years has had a defining influence on ancient history, on the emergence of the first civilizations, on the patterns uh, around the Mediterranean Sea. But planetary features still have a grip, still have a defining influence over our modern lives today. We still see the distinctive fingerprint of planetary processes and even politics. As Herb hinted at in the beginning, we can spot patterns in how people vote, which president or which party people want to lead them, linking back to the geological rocks beneath their feet. An example I've got to give you of this is in this part of the world, in the southern states of the US. So I'm going to strip off the satellite map and now show you the political map. And perhaps unsurprisingly, 
The southern states in the US are, on the whole, a very Republican area. We're seeing a sea of Republican red in that voting map. But some counties do vote Democrats, even the southern states. And what you'll notice is that those Democrat voting counties aren't scattered randomly across the map. There's a structure to where people are voting Democrats. There's a pattern in the blue areas of that map. There's a large, uh, sort of thick column on the left-hand side here, those on the banks of the Mississippi River. So at least there's a geographical feature that corresponds with the voting there. But what you'll also notice is this crescent of blue voting Democrat counties arcing right across the southern states, across hundreds of miles. And that doesn't correspond to anything we can see in the landscape. So if I tear off the political map and now show you a terrain map, we can see the Mississippi River on the left-hand side there. The Appalachian Mountains are much further to the north. They can't account for this political feature we see in the map. So now if I tear off that terrain map and now show you a geological map. We're looking at rocks beneath our feet that are about 75 million years old, which you can see in shades of grey there. And now if I overlay back on top of our geological map, our political map, you'll see there's this incredible correlation. People are voting for Democrat on that band of rocks on the surface, which are about 75 million years old. And this doesn't make any sense at all, right? These people aren't geologists. They're not going to their back garden, or indeed their backyard, and drilling a borehole and dating the rocks, going, ah, oh, the rocks in my backyard are 90 million years old. I've got to vote for Trump now. I wanted to vote for Biden, but I've got to vote for the Republicans. There's no direct link, of course, between the rocks in your area and how you choose to vote. You have free will in that sense. But what there is, is a long chain of cause and effect, reaching back through hundreds of years of human history, and then millions of years of our planet's history. And what was going on on Earth 75 million years ago when that band of rocks was laid down is that the sea levels are much, much higher than they are today. And the ocean lapped right up through the middle of North America in a great inland sea. And so the rocks laid down that period were effectively thick sediments of seafloor mud, which got compacted, got buried, got re-exposed on the surface today by erosion along that particular band of 75 million year old rocks. And it was realized in the mid 1800s, that band of rocks gives a soil on the surface which is particularly thick and dark and black and fertile. It was the perfect kind of soil for growing cash crops like cotton, which you could sell back to Europe for hard currency. And unfortunately, in this period of American history, growing cotton on the plantations used slave labor. People were captured in their homeland in Africa, thrown into chains, sailed across the Atlantic, forced to work on plantations growing cotton, specifically along that band of rocks. And even today, hundreds of years after the Civil War, after the emancipation from slavery, after the Civil Rights Movement, still today the greatest concentration of black African Americans live along that band of 75 million year old rocks. People who still today, unfortunately, suffer from poor socioeconomic opportunities, poor health care, poor education, poor employment opportunities. People are much more likely to vote for Democrat electoral promises rather than Republican electoral promises. And the town, so the city that I've marked for you there, the city of Montgomery, is the place where in 1955, a black woman called Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white gentleman on the bus. The very epicenter of the entire civil rights movement, which transformed society in the States began smack, bang, right in the middle of that band of 75 million year old rocks. You can trace back through economics and agricultural systems to the soil, to the geology, to our planet's history and explain voting patterns and what underscores them, what is the foundation for those patterns we see, see today. And just to demonstrate, I've not cherry-picked the only example around the world where this works. Here's an example from our own Fair Isles. On the left, we're looking at uh, constituencies which tend to vote for Labour. On the right, we have rocks beneath our feet which are about 320 million years old. And again, there is an astonishing correlation between the rocks and the voting. This particular pattern is explained by the fact that those rocks 320 million years ago were laid down during the Carboniferous 
period. Period in Earth's history when our carbon recycling system broke down, trees grew, died, fell over, but refused to rot for millions of years. The Carboniferous is when the great coal fields of the Earth were created, uh, where in Britain we realized we could dig up this coal, throw it into furnaces to fuel ourselves through the Industrial Revolution. And the last step in that particular chain is that the Labour political party grew out of labour unions and in particular coal mining labour unions. So those are the three quick-fire examples I was able to give you uh, from the book from Origins. There's plenty of other stories, uh, such as what catastrophe half a million years ago was the original Brexit? When did Britain first separate from Europe? And how has that been so significant in the history of our nation? Uh, why do most of us eat a bowl of cereal for breakfast? How is the planet determined even what we choose to eat for our, for our meals? Uh, why did Holland's drowned landscape contribute to the development of the modern financial system? Why was capitalism born in the Netherlands rather than somewhere else in the realm, around the world? Uh, there's answers to all those questions uh, in the book. It's available outside. I know it's quite cringeworthy, but I pay my mortgage on selling books, so I'll mention that it exists at least. Uh, if you're a teacher or, or you're an educator or you know someone who is, there's a huge amount of freely available educational resources based around the book. And all of the maps I created myself that I've showed you, you can download, download those for free and use them in the classroom. Um, Herb, I nailed it within just one minute and 20 seconds over my time. Uh, the book I've just been talking about is Origins. My book before that is called The Knowledge, How to Rebuild Our World After an Apocalypse. It's how you could reboot civilization after some kind of global reset and do Minecraft for real to rebuild and recover everything we take for granted in our modern lives as a thought experiment. And my most recent book out uh, last month, it came in fact out on the same day as Helen Chersky's, who you heard about earlier this morning. Uh, it's called Being Human, How Our Biology Shaped World History. So doing a similar thing as what I've been talking about just now with features of planet Earth, but intrinsic features about us as an animal, as a species of our humanness, in terms of our genetics, or our anatomy, or our physiology, or our psychology, and weird cognitive glitches in our processing called cognitive biases. You can learn all about that sort of thing in being human. But thank you ever so much um, for listening to me uh, rattle through those examples just now. I will be outside, out, uh, outside afterwards. If you want to come down and ask any questions or just have a chat, please come up and, and say hello. I'd be delighted to talk to you. Thank you so very much. Cheers. <laughs>Really, I guess one quick question uh, with regard to the last example you gave. So I guess famously in the last general election, the, I guess, was it the red wall that was broken? Yeah. Uh, particularly up in this part of the country. Would you, would you expect that pattern to, in other words, has the, has the link to the 320 million, has it been broken or is it something that is, if you will, an anomaly and that we would likely return back to traditional patterns? It, it waxes and wanes. And of course, I'd never make a deterministic argument. I would never say that the geology absolutely decries that people have to vote in this particular way. Sure. But it is nonetheless a pattern of correlation mm. that we see. And with anything in politics, the popularities of, of the major parties wax and wane. Uh, when Labour is being hammered by the Tories, the uh, pattern becomes clearer because the, Tor sorry, the Labour heartland is more... Uh, in relief, more in contrast, right. which you can see in the map. Right. Uh, when Labour does well, then it gets a bit sort of blurred because lots of other constituencies vote for Labour as, uh, as well in that particular election cycle, that particular year. But underneath all of that is that sort of that core, that heartland that links back to, to the geology. Right, so it tends to return back to that, that geological mean, if you will. Yes, exactly. Yes. So it returns oh, to the statistical mean, yeah. yeah. Lewis, thank you so much. Thank you ever so Cheers. much. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers, guys.